Okay, this is Paul Geyer, and I will be your presenter today for this webinar and introduction to cathodic protection for underground structures. Um, quick uh, housekeeping comment, uh, the way the webinars move along is I press on with the discussion for 50 minutes, then we take a 10 minute break, come back, do another 50 minutes, 10 minutes, keep going through that cycle. Now, this is just a two PDH um, <clears throat> or two hour webinar. So we'll only run through that uh, twice, um, that cycle twice. And uh, um, the, um, uh, title of the webinar, I want to touch bases on some of the words in it. Uh, the first one is introduction, because that's what this is. This is not a webinar that is targeted at uh, engineers that have been dealing in great depth with cathodic protection and corrosion protection uh, for many years, and you're looking for a very detailed, in-depth discussion. That's not what this is. Uh, this webinar is targeted at the uh, uh, all of the members of the building design team. And you're uh, <clears throat> probably at this point in time, uh, just passingly aware that there may be cathodic protection issues associated with a project that has come across your desk. But that's about the extent of your involvement so far. So uh, uh, I hope that's uh, about what you thought for signing up for, because that's what this is. It's just an introduction. Now, another word I want to put emphasis on is uh, cathodic. Uh, don't confuse that with corrosion. Uh, your objective, what you're doing, uh, is providing corrosion protection for your underground structure. Um, and uh, uh, you actually have two tools uh, available to you to uh, prevent corrosion of your underground structure. And uh, cathodic protection is one of them. So don't get those two uh, terms confused. Also, I want to put emphasis on the words underground structures. That's what I'm going to be talking about almost exclusively today. Uh, another large category of corrosion protection projects is underwater uh, projects, a pipeline that's underwater for one reason or another. And um, but the uh, I think it's fair to say that the majority of projects that uh, we run into as garden variety, if you will, uh, engineers is uh, our underground projects. You're putting something in the ground, uh, a tank, a pipeline, and you want it to not rust away, corrode away. So with that um, uh, little explanation now, um, Let's get our controls moving here. Okay. Um, by way of introduction, this is a little bit about me and what I've been doing for the last few decades. For uh, 35 years, I was what I characterize as a straight ahead designer, cranking out drawings and specifications for the construction of buildings and a fairly broad spectrum of uh, infrastructure features of one sort or another. Um, I, after 35 years, for another nine years, I was in what might be characterized as the public policy arena, where I was a principal advisor to the California legislature on infrastructure and capital outlay projects. So that's what I've been doing. I got uh, registered in a few different things along the way. 
Uh, I'm basically, though, a mechanical engineer. That's my degree and my first registration. So that's what I've been doing. Now, OK, here's kind of how I'll be talking about things today. The chapters in the book. Let's see, I'm going to pause here and just check my chat box and see if I've got any insightful questions that have been asked. Nope, don't have any. So um, <clears throat> these are kind of the chapters in the book, what I'll be talking about. Some um, uh, introductory comments on cathodic protection, kind of the underlying physics involved. And then um, in chapter two, uh, cathodic protection design, we will walk through the uh, steps in the design process for uh, cathodic protection. And there are two uh, uh, cathodic protection approaches that you can use. And we'll walk through the, uh, the steps for each of those. Chapter three is a short chapter, but it's an important one. It's a current requirement test and uh, more about that later on. Chapter four, we'll get into some examples of galvanic cathodic protection design. Uh, and uh, in chapter five, uh, time permitting, we'll get into some examples of impressed current cathodic protection design. And generally speaking, I think it's gonna be fair to say that uh, we're not gonna have a uh, enough time to walk through all of these slides today. But there's some fairly good uh, information. It's, it's not a design guide. It's not a design manual. But it's pretty good introductory information. And uh, you might want to get a uh, copy of the PowerPoint, these PowerPoint slides uh, from uh, the uh, webinar sponsor. And you can typically do that by uh, going to the website, uh, logging into your account, following the instructions, and you can usually uh, uh, get a copy of these PowerPoints here. Okay, uh, that uh, gets us off and running. So, um, as already indicated, this, this is an introductory uh, discussion of uh, cathodic protection systems. And again, there are only two uh, tools that you have to work with to prevent corrosion of whatever it is you're sticking in the ground. Uh, and cathodic protection is one of those two tools. Now, the... Um, uh, I make reference to whatever it is you're sticking in the ground, a tank, pipeline, et cetera, et cetera. And usually in our business, what you're sticking in the ground is made out of uh, iron, some form of iron, uh, steel, cast iron, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, but uh, the, the same general concepts apply if you were sticking something in the ground that was made out of copper or aluminum. Uh, but rarely in our business is that the case. Um, so uh, corrosion, uh, it, again, this is what you're trying to prevent is corrosion. <clears throat> and um, it's an electromechanical process in which current leaves a structure at the anode site, passes through an electrolyte, and enters the structure at the cathode site. Uh, now, the, uh, the thing that you are doing is protecting the cathode. That's why this is called cathodic protection. It's not called anodic protection. That's not what you're trying to do. You're trying to protect the cathode, and that's your uh, your iron structure, your pipeline, your tank, uh, tank or whatever. The electrolyte is the stuff that your structure is buried in, the soil, uh, or in the case of an underwater uh, 
uh, situation, the electrolyte would be water. And uh, the electrolyte uh, conducts electricity. Uh, if it's the soil, which is the situation that we're talking about here most of the time, uh, the soil is not a very good conductor of electricity, but it does conduct electricity. Uh, if it's an underwater situation, water is a better conductor, is a good conductor of electricity. And so you might think of it as uh, um, like a wire connecting the anode and the cathode, but instead it's an electrolyte, it's a soil or it's water. Um, now the bad guys in this picture are negatively charged oxygen ions that uh, uh, are out there in the soil and they get there in mysterious ways uh, chemical reactions, processes that take place in the soil uh, or um, uh, biological processes. Uh, how they get there is none of our business. Uh, we just need to recognize that they're out there and they are the bad guys. And uh, the reason they're the bad guys is that, uh, as you will recall from uh, uh, your uh, freshman chemistry, I guess, class or freshman physics class, uh, opposites attract. Uh, a positively charged ion is attracted to a negatively charged ion. They move, they migrate together, and they bind and form a stable compound. And that's just the nature of, of what uh, ions do negatively and positively charged. And ones that we are concerned with here are the uh, negatively charged uh, oxygen ions in the soil. And uh, they are looking for a positively charged ion to bind with. And they look around and they see your iron uh, cathode buried in the ground and that's very attractive uh, to them. And so the negative charged oxygen ion migrates over to your positively charged uh, uh, buried structure or cathode and binds with it. And uh, you end up with uh, uh, something a chemical, ferric oxide or ferrous oxide. And that is corrosion, that is rust. That's that red stuff that you don't want to be there. And uh, you want to prevent that. And what you are doing is with cathodic protection is constructing an electrical circuit that will uh, uh, result in the negatively charged oxygen ion in the soil being attracted to the anode uh, in this electrical circuit that you construct rather than to the cathode. And so uh, it's, uh, that's what you're doing is constructing an electrical circuit. A uh, circuit is uh, what current will flow in and it consists basically of theoretically or fundamentally of an anode, uh, a, uh, uh, a something like a copper wire connecting the anode to the cathode. The cathode again is, is the structure that you are protecting. And then the electrical circuit passes through the electrolyte back to the anode and the current just keeps flowing in this electrical circuit. <clears throat> anode to copper wire to cathode to electrolyte and you have a, ca a, a current flowing in, the, uh, in that circuit. And uh, that causes the negatively charged oxygen ions in the soil to be attracted to the anode rather than the cathode. And so uh, it's fundamental in cathodic protection that the anode is going to corrode. 
Uh, <clears throat> now the anode might be a piece of metal that you uh, stick in the ground. Zinc, manganese, magnesium, like that. And uh, connect copper wire to it and then to your iron cathode. Uh, and the uh, uh, circuit, the electrical circuit that you create and the current that is flowing in that circuit causes the negatively charged oxygen ions to migrate uh, over to your zinc rod, say your anode, and you get uh, corrosion of the anode, zinc oxide. And uh, uh, this is a fundamental point that you need to keep in mind is that uh, over time, your anodes are going to get corroded away. Uh, it's not the, uh, uh, usually it's not as visually evident a corrosion. It may be just kind of a white powdery appearance on the surface, but it is corroding away. And as a result of that corrosion of the anode, your cathode does not corrode. And that's what you're concerned about. So um, uh, keep the picture in mind of a, uh, an electrical circuit, anode, something like a zinc rod, uh, a copper wire connecting the anode to the cathode. The cathode is your iron thing that you've got in the ground, a tank, a pipeline, etc. And then the electrolyte, which uh, in the situations we're talking about, the electrolyte is soil. Although, as I say, in the uh, uh, there is another category of a uh, large category of uh, cathodic protection uh, situations where the electrolyte is water, like it's a pipeline or a tank that's in the water. So that's the cruise cell. Whoops. Uh, I need to get my slides back here where they're behaving. Um, so uh, I, I said right at the start, there are two tools or two approaches that you have to protect your cathode. One of them is cathodic protection and the other is coatings. And you will uh, uh, almost uh, always use both of these uh, tools to protect your, uh, your structure that you've put in the ground. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, it's basically the way it works is uh, the coatings that you apply to your pipe or to your uh, tank or whatever it is that you're sticking in the ground. Uh, it, uh, when first applied, it's, it's usually, it usually does a very good job. It, it, it prevents corrosion of uh, uh, 99 or 99.5% 99 of the total surface area of your structure that you are uh, protecting. And uh, uh, it, um, uh, let's see now, I can't, I want to get rid of my, something that's in my screen here, have to deal with that later. Um, <clears throat> so, um, uh, to protect uh, your uh, buried structure from and to prevent it from corroding excessively, uh, you use these two tools, coatings and cathodic protection. And basically what you're doing is you are making a, an assumption of how effective your coating is going to be. And you're making this assumption based on uh, uh, some point in time out in the future, 15 years, 20 years, 10 years, something like that, whatever. This is just an assumption that you make and you make it based on your personal experience, the experience of your agency or company or the experiential information that you find in some uh, uh, design manual or some technical literature. Uh, and the uh, 
uh, you, you, that's the basis of your uh, corrosion protection, that it's going to be your uh, pipe or tank is going to be uh, out 15 years in the future, is going to be adequately protected. 10% of its surface area is going to be adequately protected by the uh, coating that you apply and the uh, remainder is of the surface area uh, of your cathode structure needs to be uh, protected using a cathodic protection system. Now the best, uh, there are two cathodic protection All your audio has dropped. Check your uh, microphone or something. We can't hear you. Oh, okay. Pardon me. Pardon me. Um, yeah, I don't know how that happened. My microphone uh, got muted. Uh, you can hear me now, I assume, right? Yeah, you can. Uh, okay. So backing up a bit. The two uh, types of cathodic protection that are available to you are illustrated in this figure 1-1. One, one. The one on the left is the galvanic anode, or frequently referred to as the sacrificial anode uh, system. And uh, then the one on the right is called the impressed current system. And uh, the, uh, starting with the one on the left, the galvanic or sacrificial anode system is quite simple. Uh, you just uh, select an anode material, uh, a raw material for a rod, and it might be magnesium or zinc or something like that. Uh, you connect a copper wire to it, connect the other end of the copper wire uh, to the uh, cathode, which is the structure that you are uh, protecting, the pipeline, the buried tank. And then you have the electrolyte. And uh, the uh, electrolyte in the cases that we're talking about here is the soil. And uh, this and current flows in the, this electrical circuit. And the reason that it flows is because uh, that metals have different what's called electromotive potential. And in other words, this is the uh, strength uh, which they exert on a negatively charged oxygen ion uh, in the soil. And so certain metals will uh, attract those negatively charged oxygen ions more strongly uh, than others. And uh, 
So you want with the uh, system on the left, galvanic or sacrificial anode system, you want to select that anode uh, of a an appropriate material. And I'll talk more about this and uh, show you more stuff further on as, as we go along. But uh, with the simple galvanic or sacrificial anode system, uh, the inherent electromotive force properties uh, of your anode material, magnesium or whatever, uh, as compared to the electromotive potential uh, of your protected structure, which almost always is going to be some form of iron, is such that the negatively charged oxygen ion in the soil is going to be more strongly attracted to the magnesium, say, anode, uh, than it is to your iron cathode protected structure. And so the negatively charged oxygen ion will migrate over and bind with the uh, positively charged magnesium in the anode rod uh, and form magnesium oxide, which is corrosion, but it's corrosion of the anode. And uh, as a result of this, the uh, cathode uh, is not attacked by the negatively charged oxygen ions in the soil, and you don't have corrosion. Now, the system on the left, the uh, galvanic or sacrificial anode system, uh, is dependent on these fundamental uh, chemical characteristics, I guess is the way to uh, refer to it. Uh, the, 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 the fact that uh, the electromotive force uh, for different metals is different. And that's what you're relying on, is that you can select a metal for your anode that will more uh, strongly attract negatively charged oxygen ions to itself and thereby the oxygen negatively charged oxygen ions will leave your uh, cathode, your iron protected structure alone. Now, the, uh, the sacrificial anode system then, though, is limited in its uh, capacity, its strength. Uh, to, uh, it's limited by these fundamental properties uh, of the different metals, magnesium, zinc, iron, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so to overcome that uh, uh, limitation over the years, uh, there has been developed the system on the right, which is uh, an impressed current system. And it looks uh, quite a bit similar to the uh, galvanic or sacrificial anode system on the left. But you see that uh, what has been added to this circuit is a source of uh, direct current. Uh, now, this could be a battery. Uh, but uh, the problem, of course, with batteries is they uh, discharge and only uh, are effective for a limited period of time. Uh, and so the device that uh, is inserted into the circuit to provide the direct current uh, is a rectifier, which is a, an electrical device that takes uh, alternating current utility power and converts it to direct current uh, power, which is what you need. Uh, for the effective operation uh, of the impressed current system. And uh, also the rectifier is inherently, it's adjustable. You can turn it up and get more uh, direct current output, turn it down, get less. And this, this is a, uh, an important uh, characteristic of the rectifier. So the um, impressed current system, then on the right, uh, again, you have uh, uh, an anode. Uh, in the case of impressed current systems, for reasons that we'll get to a little further on, uh, the anodes are typically 
uh, an alloy of cast iron rather than um, the magnesium or zinc uh, anodes that would be in the galvanic or sacrificial anode uh, system. But um, uh, you fundamentally, you've got, you've got an anode, uh, you've got a cathode, which is your protected structure. You've got a copper wire, nice uh, electrical conductivity about it, connecting the two. And you have inserted into that circuit a rectifier, a source of DC current uh, so that you can uh, crank up the, uh, uh, the capacity of the impressed current system to uh, provide more effective uh, cathodic protection in the more corrosive soil environments. So these are the two types of cathodic protection system that you have available uh, to you. Galvanic or sacrificial anode on the left relies uh, strictly on the uh, fundamental characteristics, chemical characteristics or physical characteristics of different metals. Uh, and, but it, uh, as a result of that, it is, has limited capacity. So uh, you're gonna be using the uh, galvanic or sacrificial anode system in the less corrosive soil environments. It's cheaper, but if your soil environment is not that corrosive, uh, that's the one you're gonna select to use uh, for uh, your project. But if you're, you have a more corrosive soil environment, then you're going to have to go to the additional expense, uh, uh, design expense uh, uh, and construction expense. Uh, and also importantly, with an impressed current system, uh, there's uh, quite a bit of what I call babysitting that needs to go on in the O&M phase. Uh, you know, in other words, uh, regular monitoring of the uh, performance of the of the system, and uh, uh, adjustments need to be made uh, as you move along through time, and uh, that's because the the circuitry uh, deteriorates. The water tables bouncing up and down the soils moving around, uh, you get corrosion at the connections. And uh, so you have, to, um, you have to make adjustments uh, to the, uh, typically to the output uh, direct current from the rectifier. So these are the two cathodic protection systems you've got to work with. Okay, now, um, Let's see, I already talked about everything on that slide. Uh, and uh, I talked about the impressed current system as the alternative. Okay, uh, you've got a, a, a project uh, and uh, it may be uh, a new project where you are putting something new in the ground a uh, pipe or a tank or something like that. Or it may be an existing structure that has been out there uh, for some period of time. And you've just kind of uh, decided it looks like it could use a little cathodic protection. It's starting to show some rust uh, corrosion. And uh, so there, uh, this is an important consideration is, are you dealing with a new construction project or an existing feature that is out there in the ground and has been there for a while? Um, so to design the uh, system, you need uh, uh, to have certain information available. Uh, one of the key points is you have to be able, 
you have to have complete uh, shop drawings, or if you will, or contract drawings that uh, give you the information you need to calculate the total surface area of the protected structure, because the total surface area of the protected structure is what determines the design capacity that you design into your cathodic protection system. And uh, so, uh, and sometimes that uh, uh, may not be uh, readily available. So you, you have to overcome that. You need to be able to calculate the total surface area of your protected structure. And uh, you need to have electrical isolation. You need to have drawings or uh, other information to assure you that your protected structure is electrically isolated from anything else. Um, and it, the approach you often are taking uh, for a, as an example, a pipeline is that you chop the pipeline up into uh, finite lengths, 50 feet long, 100 feet long, whatever. And then you put uh, uh, electrically isolating flanges in the pipeline uh, and, and then the next uh, element in the uh, protected structure is attached. And uh, uh, the, uh, let's see, uh, just a quick little comment um, on the audio uh, portion of the, discussion, keep in mind that uh, uh, your microphones there at your computer or whatever uh, will tend to pick up uh, uh, background noise there in your office, uh, taking phone calls or um, uh, discussing things. And I just heard a little background noise there. So uh, be sure to avoid that. Uh, if uh, worst came to worst, I might have to mute one of your audio streams, uh, but uh, just just be alert to the keep uh, uh, it down. So um, electrical isolation, because you're designing a uh, cathodic protection system uh, for a finite uh, piece of uh, or for a finite uh, feature. Um, that is buried in the ground, a length of pipe, a tank, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, you need to have uh, uh, assurances that, uh, and like a, with a pipeline, you've got a, a main pipeline that may be running along, distributing something, natural gas, and uh, uh, you have branches that take off. And you need to be alert to the fact that when, if you're protecting, if you're providing uh, cathodic protection for the main pipeline, you need to make sure that it is electrically isolated from the branches that uh, take off. And that, that's done, of course, with isolating flanges. Uh, also, you need to be alert to uh, avoidance of short circuits. So this is just uh, if something inadvertent in the ground, another pipe is running around down there and happens to be touching your pipe that you're trying to protect, that results in a short circuit, which uh, uh, renders the uh, cathodic protection system uh, ineffective. So you have to have assurances that uh, that is not going to be the case. Um, so now let's, um, uh, you've got this, this physical information. Um, another important piece of information to see if you can have available to you is historical information. Um, you had a similar pipeline in similar soil conditions and it's been out there in the field for 15 years and uh, you go out there and there's very little corrosion and the anodes aren't corroding away terribly fast, 
So whatever uh, the design was that you used on that earlier pipeline, uh, it's a perfectly legitimate uh, engineering judgment that, well, what worked there uh, probably should work here. So we'll do the same thing here as we did there. Uh, and that, that's that's legitimate. Um, so um, uh, keep uh, that information, uh, that kind of information in the front of your thinking. Um, okay, now the the now we're moving into chapter two, which is the uh, protect chaotic protection design. Um, and um, I kind of covered these earlier paragraphs here, just got through talking about the uh, significance and the utility of the corrosion history of uh, structures in the area or similar areas. Now, another important piece of information uh, to have is uh, an electrolyte resistivity survey. This is a piece of field work uh, that you do, but you can only do it if what you are doing is uh, undertaking to apply uh, cathodic protection to an existing structure that's already in the ground out there. If there is an existing structure uh, out there in the ground, you can go out and conduct an electrolyte resistivity survey. And we'll see that in chapter three. It's a simple little piece of field work, but very important. And uh, <clears throat> it, uh, uh, if you're, the structure that you are undertaking to protect is uh, already out there, it exists, you can conduct an electrolyte resistivity survey as part of your field work. Uh, but if the structure does not uh, exist out there in the ground, then you cannot conduct the <coughs> electrolyte resistivity survey. Um, the electrolyte resistivity survey is um, means how resistant is the electrolyte or the soil to the passage of electric current in it. Um, and uh, soil varies. Uh, and uh, so some soils will pass uh, uh, an electric current more readily than others. Usually this is kind of a function of how much moisture the soil has in it. Um, and so you go out uh, and uh, uh, you, you need to know how resistive your electrolyte or your soil is um, to the passage of current. <clears throat> and it, uh, it's, a, it's a simple little uh, test setup. Uh, you stick uh, electrodes in the ground uh, a, a known distance apart, um, and you stick a source of uh, current, a battery, in that test setup, and uh, you uh, <clears throat> measure the, and you include an, an ohm meter uh, in the circuit, and you can measure the uh, resistivity, how uh, resistive uh, the soil is to the uh, 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 flow of current. And um, this is how you uh, determine the corrosivity of the soil. Um, so if you go out there as part of your field work, conduct a soil resistivity study, and if uh, the uh, field work uh, indicates the soil uh, has a resistivity in the range of zero to 2000 ohm centimeters. Now, ohm centimeter is the unit of soil resistivity. For each centimeter that the current 
passes uh, or uh, through the uh, electrolyte soil, it encounters so many ohms of resistance. And uh, so if the uh, soil resistivity that you measure as part of your field work is in the range of zero to 2000 ohm centimeters, that is <clears throat> Uh, a low resistivity soil, and that is characterized as a severely corrosive soil. So low soil resistivity means uh, severely corrosive soil environment. If the soil resistivity that you measure as part of your field work is in the range of 2,000 to 10,000 ohm centimeters, that's characterized as moderate to severely uh, to severe corrosivity. 10,000 to 30,000 ohm centimeters, that is characterized as a mildly corrosive soil condition. Above 30,000 ohm centimeters, uh, that is considered to be a condition where you're not likely to have much of a uh, corrosion uh, problem. Uh, <clears throat> and so the, uh, uh, the, when the soil resistivity is low, that means the corrosivity of the soil is high or severe. When the soil resistivity is high, above 30,000 ohm centimeters, that is a, uh, uh, a soil condition that it's not particularly corrosive. And so if the soil resistivity that you, that you measure is above 30,000 ohm centimeters, uh, you may actually then make a judgment call that it's not going to be worth the time and effort to incorporate cathodic protection features into this project because the soil is, is not uh, corrosive. Um, another piece of field work that you undertake when you're uh, uh, doing the soil resistivity tests uh, is an electrolyte pH survey. How acidic or alkali alkalinic is the soil? And the reason is that uh, for somewhat mysterious reasons, the more acidic the soil is, uh, the more uh, prone the soil is to be corrosive. And so the electrolyte pH data that you acquire is uh, um, <clears throat> uh, kind of a supplementary piece of information. I'll talk more about this a little further on. Now, uh, I am looking over at my clock here, and I see that we're 10 minutes before the hour. Uh, and so it's time for us to take our first break. And so let's do that. Uh, let's take a 10-minute break, come back on the hour, and we'll pick up here. And we'll... Uh, uh, talk about the structure to electrolyte potential survey. So I'll see you all in 10 minutes on the hour.
Okay, uh, this is Paul Geyer. I'm back and I uh, am catching up with my um, uh, questions. Um, <clears throat> Paul has questions. I'm confused why the soil resistivity test can't be done when the structure is not installed yet. Can you explain that? Well, I, I, there are, um, I, I didn't do a good job of uh, clarifying this when I was talking about it. There are, <clears throat> there is the soil resistivity test, the testing that you do as part of your field work. Uh, and that uh, uh, is, you do that uh, when you have both a, a new structure being put in the ground or if you have an existing structure. Uh, the other uh, test that uh, can only be uh, undertaken as field work uh, is the structure to versus the electrolyte potential survey. And that can only be done if the uh, structure is existing out there in the ground. Now I'm going to get this to this as um, our next uh, topic 2.1.8 uh, here uh, in a moment and maybe this will become a little bit clearer but there are two different things that I'm trying to talk about. One is the soil re resistivity measurement which you can uh, do in the field uh, with both a new structure and an existing structure. But then the other thing that uh, I haven't uh, kind of got, I guess, garbled up with it uh, and uh, haven't really gotten to talk about yet, but I will is the uh, paragraph 2.1.8 structure to electrolyte potential survey. I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but uh, I, uh, let's, let's see how uh, things go forward. Uh, let's see, uh, we, I had another question here. Why is the oxygen negative charge in the, the soil, neg in the, in the soil, the negatively charged oxygen ion attracted to the structure cathode, which is also negative. Um, it's the positively charged iron ion in the your uh, protected structure that uh, the negatively charged oxygen ion is attracted to. Um, and uh, uh, the, the, the terms cathode and anode uh, are referring to the, um, the electrical circuit and the direction of flow of the current in the circuit from anode through the copper wire to the cathode to the electrolyte through the electrolyte and then back and then it just keeps uh, rotating around. Um, so let me uh, uh, let me press on here a little bit and maybe some of this will become a tiny bit clearer. Um, let's see, I'm gonna close my chat box. Okay, so um, uh, you, your field work, you're going out and you're doing your uh, field work, you've measured the electrolyte resistivity, the how resistive the soil is to the passage of an electric current through it. You've done that and you can do that survey uh, when you're putting a new structure in the ground or when you're, you've got an existing structure in the ground and you're just adding cathodic protection to it. Um, uh, then I mentioned the electrolyte pH survey, uh, how uh, alkaline or acidic the soil is. The more uh, acidic the soil is, 
the uh, that tends to uh, promote corrosion. And I'll, I'll, you'll you'll see as we move forward here uh, how you in your decision making in the design process how you uh, take into account the uh, pH uh, survey results that you came up with as part of your initial field work. Now, though, let's let's get to the uh, structure to electrolyte potential survey. Um, the structure is the the thing that you are protecting. It's the cathode, and the electrolyte is the um, soil. And um, the uh, <clears throat> a, a, an important number to uh, bear in mind is minus 0.85 volts. In other words, uh, and this is according to a, an industry uh, standard, if you will, NACE standard RPO1, National Association of Corrosion Engineers. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, the, over many decades of, uh, of engineering work, it has been determined by the engineers involved with NACE that if the cathode is at least uh, 0.85 volts more negative than the uh, electrolyte, then the structure is considered to be adequately protected uh, for uh, corrosion protection purposes. Uh, so that's that's your target, so to speak. You're trying to set up an electrical circuit uh, that will result in the cathode being at least 0.85 volts uh, more negative than the electrolyte, the soil. And, and this kind of, you can see how this would be the way you would want things because you, what the bad guys, again, are the negatively charged oxygen ions in the soil. And uh, if, the, um, uh, if the cathode is more negative than the electrolyte, those negatively charged oxygen ions will be pushed away from the cathode and driven uh, to the anode, which is this other rod that you have stuck in the ground. Uh, made of magnesium or zinc or something like that. So, but you can only uh, uh, measure this structure to electrolyte potential if the structure exists out there uh, on the ground. Now, a little further on, there's a, uh, a figure that uh, will make this um, structure to electrolyte piece of field work a little clearer, uh, but it, again, the structure to electrolyte potential uh, is can only be undertaken as field work if the structure exists out there in the ground. Uh, let's see. Okay, and. Um, and I, th I think I took care of that question. Uh, okay, now, uh, so um, <clears throat> how much current needs to be flowing in this electrical circuit in order to achieve your target uh, of minus 0.85 volts, uh, the cathode being minus 0.85 volts or 0.85 volts more negative uh, than uh, the electrolyte, the soil. And uh, so your target is to achieve a condition where the cathode is more negative than the electrolyte. And that pushes the negatively charged oxygen ions away from 
cathode to the anode. Now, um, a rule of thumb has been developed uh, over the decades in this field uh, as to uh, how much uh, current must be flowing in the circuit to have adequate cathodic protection. And that rule of thumb, and this is just one that has been developed by practice and observation, and it is a minimum figure, but it is two milliamperes per square foot of bare, bare area of the protected structure. This is just a rule of thumb, but it, uh, absent any other information, historical information or whatever, um, uh, if you have two milliamperes uh, per square foot of bare structure area, then there is a, uh, a reasonable assumption you can make that your structure is adequately protected. Um, the, uh, uh, now, an important point to emphasize here in calculating using two milliamperes per square foot rule of thumb is we're talking about bare area of the protected structure. And I said at the start that you've got two tools to use in protecting the structure, coatings and cathodic protection. And you simply make an assumption based on your personal experience, your agency company's experience or something you see come up with in the technical literature that uh, coding systems at your design point in time out there in the future, 15 years, 10 years, whatever, uh, that the coating system you're using will be 95% uh, effective at uh, protecting the structure. So that means 95% uh, of the structure's surface is going to be adequately protected by the coating and the um, uh, cathodic protection system only needs to protect the remaining 5% of the area or however you, you make these assumptions, 95%, 93%, 98%, whatever. And these, again, these assumptions are made uh, as of a point in time quite a ways in the future uh, because the coatings uh, deteriorate over time. So um, how much current is required uh, for cathodic protection then? It can be determined three ways. One is by an actual test on existing structures using a temporary cathodic protection set up. And you'll see a schematic on this shortly. So if the structure exists out there in the ground, you can conduct uh, a, uh, a test to determine how much current uh, needs to be flowing in the circuit in order to achieve your, your minimum target of uh, minus 0.85 volts uh, between the cathode and the electrolyte. But you can only do this test if the structure exists. Uh, the other, the next approach that you can use, and you have to use this if the uh, structure does not exist out there in the ground, is the theoretical calculation based on coding efficiency. And this simply is making an assumption that the coating will protect 95% of the surface area. And uh, the rule of thumb that has developed over the years uh, to use uh, a current density of two milliamperes per square foot of bare uh, tank or pipe area. 
Uh, and then the third uh, way that you can determine the requirement is uh, just using historical information. Uh, what was done with similar structures and similar soil conditions in the past? How did it work? Uh, we did this in the past, worked pretty good. We'll do the same thing here. That can be a legitimate uh, uh, conclusion to reach. So now, the uh, current requirement uh, uh, being calculated on the basis of coating efficiency and current density. Uh, coating efficiency, coating will protect 95% of the surface area, 5% will be unprotected, and you apply the current density of 2 milliamperes, minimum of 2 milliamperes per square foot. <clears throat> and that tells you the uh, current that is required uh, in, to be flowing in the circuit to achieve your target uh, condition of having the cathode, uh, your protected structure, uh, at least minus 0.85 uh, volts more negative than the electrolyte. So the current required is calculated simply with equation 2, 1. I is the total protective required. Um, a is the total structure surface area in square feet. I prime is the required current density, a minimum of two milliamperes per square foot. And CE is the coding efficiency, whatever you assume, 95%, 97%, 90%, whatever. Um, so uh, equation two one is just a simple calculation of the uh, um, current required. Now, this next table here um, kind of in a way sort of throws a, a, a bit of a monkey wrench into the work. The current density required may actually vary uh, quite significantly depending upon the soil conditions, the electrolyte conditions. Um, and um, uh, you see here uh, for well aerated neutral soil, you see that the uh, current density uh, uh, typically required is two to three milliamperes per square foot of bare uh, structure area. So this, this is where that two, minimum of two milliamperes per square foot of bare uh, structure area comes from. If you have uh, unusual soil conditions uh, that are enumerated here, wet soil, highly acidic soil, heated soil, seawater, et cetera, et cetera, uh, you can have substantially different current density requirements. But the well aerated neutral soil is a uh, a commonly encountered soil condition. Uh, so that's where this, this rule of thumb of a minimum of two milliamperes per square foot of bare uh, structure area comes from. Um, okay, so, uh, The, the need for cathodic protection then, if the structure exists out there in the field, you can conduct a current requirement survey, which you'll see a schematic of here shortly. Um, and that uh, will, that test will tell you what current needs to be flowing in the circuit. Uh, if it's not an existing structure, then the standard practice is to assume a current density of at least two milliamperes per square foot of bare, uh, bare pipe area. Uh, 
but uh, again, this, this can be overridden by uh, historical data uh, for similar structures in similar soil conditions. Um, now, uh, the um, soil resistivity survey that you conducted as part of your work, measuring uh, how resistive the soil is to the flow of electricity. And the unit again of uh, uh, soil resistivity is ohm centimeters. And um, if the uh, resistivity is low uh, of the soil, that is considered a highly corrosive uh, uh, soil condition. It's easy for the negatively charged oxygen ions to migrate around and get to uh, the cathode or the anode. Um, but then the um, um, uh, the more uh, resistive the soil is to the passage of current, then that becomes a less corrosive soil environment. So, and there is a tipping point then. Uh, basically, it, the soil resistivity runs from uh, zero ohm centimeters up to over 30,000 ohm centimeters. But there's a tipping point there uh, on one side of which you will use uh, the less powerful but cheaper uh, uh, sacrificial anode system. And on the other side of this tipping point of uh, soil resistivities, you would have to make a decision to use the more expensive, more complex, uh, impressed current system. Where is that tipping point in, uh, in the range between zero and 30,000 ohm centimeters? Well, it's at about 5,000 ohm centimeters. So uh, below 5,000 ohm centimeters, that is a highly corrosive soil environment. And you're gonna have to probably use the uh, uh, more powerful impressed current system. Uh, between 5,000 ohm centimeters and 30,000 ohm centimeters, that is uh, the less uh, corrosive soil environment. And so you can probably, you'll probably be able to get away with just using the uh, uh, less costly, uh, less complex sacrificial anode system. Above 30,000 ohm centimeters, the, uh, uh, you may reasonably reach a conclusion that uh, it's not worth the time and effort to incorporate cathodic protection features into your project, because that's, that's just not a uh, significantly corrosive environment. Um, OK, now let's look at the design steps. Uh, to design a cathodic protection system. And um, this flow chart uh, indicates the design path for the two types of cathodic protection systems, the uh, sacrificial anode uh, system uh, on the left, the column on the left, and the impressed current column on the right. So you start out up at the top um, and you first, the first thing you have to do is choose the type of cathodic protection system you are going to have to use. And that is uh, basically uh, a function of the, um, <clears throat> uh, 
porosity of the soil environment, uh, and that is determined by the uh, soil resistivity take, uh, testing. So zero to 5,000 ohm centimeters, if that's what your soil condition is, that is a highly corrosive soil environment. So you're probably going to have to make a decision to go through the design steps on the right, which is for the more powerful uh, pressed current cathodic protection system. If it's uh, <clears throat> your soil tests are uh, between 5,000 and 30,000 ohm centimeters, that is a less corrosive soil environment. So you would probably make a decision. You're going to use a sacrificial anode or galvanic system. And those are the steps on the left. So let's walk through these. But that, that's the first decision you've got to make. What kind of uh, cathodic protection system am I going to use? And uh, that decision is based to a large degree, basically, on the uh, soil resistivity measurements that you take um, in the field. Um, so now the steps in the design of the uh, less powerful but less costly uh, sacrificial anode or galvanic cathodic protection system. And this. Uh, of the simpler of the two systems involves nine steps in the uh, process. First of all, just review your soil resistivity studies to make sure there were no goof ups or anything like that. Uh, and then you, <clears throat> uh, the next step is you select an, an anode. Now, this is fundamentally an arbitrary decision or selection that you make. Now, you may make it based on some uh, personal experience you've had or that your agency company has had or something that uh, you picked up on in the technical literature. But uh, fundamentally, it is an arbitrary decision. And usually the anode is going to be magnesium or zinc for reasons that we'll see a little further on. The reason is that magnesium and zinc uh, exert a more powerful electromotive force uh, to attract the negatively charged oxygen ions uh, than does the iron, which is typically what your uh, cathode or your structure is. Uh, being made out of. Uh, but it, it's basically, it's, it's an arbitrary decision. And these anodes are uh, commercial products. They're a rod. Uh, and this table here just shows a bunch of rod sizes and their weights. Then you see um, uh, the two columns on the right talk about quote, packaged weight and quote, packaged size. That's because these uh, anodes uh, typically come in uh, what you might think of as a long uh, hot dog shaped uh, 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 bag. <clears throat> and uh, uh, then the, the bag, the rod is put into this long bag, like a burlap sack material. And then it is the bag is then filled with some kind of carbonaceous backfill material. Now, the reason for this is that uh, the reason for the carbonaceous backfill material is that it, um, first of all, it, it increases the capture efficiency of the rod. Um, it increases the diameter and so more of the negatively charged oxygen ions will bump into this bag. Once they bump into the bag, 
uh, <clears throat> they have a very easy path through the carbonaceous backfill to get to the magnesium or zinc rod inside. And uh, this increases the capture efficiency of the of the anode. So that's the purpose of this carbonaceous backfill. Also another uh, benefit of the carbonaceous backfill is that it provides a, uh, uh, a more uniform uh, pathways to the the magnesium or zinc rod. Uh, if you don't have the uh, this backfill material, you can get, uh, depending upon the soil conditions, you can get hot spots uh, where, because of the soil or the moisture content in the soil, uh, there is uh, a particular uh, path to the rod. Uh, that is uh, uh, easier for the negatively charged oxygen ions to traverse. And as a result, all of the negatively charged oxygen ions go running for this one uh, spot where it's real easy to get to the, to the rod. And you get concentrated corrosion there. And this, with time, can result in the rod uh, the, the uh, anode rod uh, corroding all the way through, and that breaks the electrical connection uh, between one end of the rod and the other. And you end up having a rod there in the ground that's only half the size that you thought it was, and you wonder why your system isn't working that well. So it um, it's uh, the carbonation backfill. It increases the capture efficiency and it increases the uniformity of contact uh, of the rod with the negatively charged oxygen ions. Um, the, uh, now the next step is to calculate the, uh, uh, the net driving potential for the anodes. Now, uh, at your leisure, you can uh, review this discussion here. The bottom line is that uh, for a typical, a typical anode rod, typically a magnesium rod, that the uh, driving potential uh, of the anode, magnesium anode rod is about uh, 0.9 volts greater than the uh, potential driving the uh, negatively charged oxygen ion to your iron structure. So, and so this is a typical, this is the typical um, uh, excess, if you will, driving potential that magnesium and zinc rods have to, they inherently uh, drive the uh, negatively charged oxygen ions to themselves uh, with uh, a 0 0.7 to 0.9 volt force. Um, so, <clears throat> Now uh, you need to calculate the number of anodes needed to meet the ground bed resistance limitations. Uh, the ground bed uh, resistance limitation uh, of the circuit is given by equation 2-2. The total resistance is equal to the anode to electrolyte resistance plus the resistance in the copper wire, plus the structure to electrolyte resistance. The structure is your cathode, uh, your protected structure. So uh, <clears throat> the total resistance can also be uh, 
determined by using Ohm's law, which is equation two, three, V equals I R, uh, voltage is equal to the current times the resistance, just using some different nomenclature here. So you can calculate the total resistance uh, using equation two, three, and uh, the, um, <clears throat> Uh, cathode to electrolyte resistance can be calculated using equation 2-2, two, two, where R is the total resistance uh, and A is the current. R, R is, the, um, is the resistance of the coating because you have coated your protected structure. And this uh, coating resistance is in ohms per square foot. And it's a figure you get from the manufacturer of the coating system. Uh, and you would want uh, <clears throat> to get a, an estimate from the supplier of the coating system for an aged coating system, 15 years in service, something like that, because that's what you're designing for that point in time. Um, R sub W is the resistance in the copper wire connecting the anode and the cathode. And it's negligible because copper is such a good conductor. Uh, also in uh, uh, certain applications, the length of the copper wire is reduced to zero and you just clamp, like on a pipeline, a, uh, uh, an anode onto the pipe, which is your cathode. And so the resistance there is zero. So uh, it's reasonable to assume that R sub W is negligible. So uh, equation uh, uh, becomes two five. Uh, the anode to uh, uh, electrolyte resistance is R sub A is equal to R sub T, which is the total resistance in the circuit minus the uh, cathode to electrolyte resistance. And this gives the maximum allowable ground bed resistance that will dictate the number of anodes required. And to calculate the number of anodes required, equation 2.6 is used. It's complex. We're not going to go into the derivation of it. But um, plugging the numbers into equation 2.6, this tells you the number of anodes that are required. Rho is the soil resistivity in ohm centimeters. Uh, R sub A is the maximum allowable ground bed resistance in ohms as computed by using equation 2.5. L is the length of the backfill column, the anode um, feet. Uh, and this, because these are commercial products, obviously this figure this length comes from the, the supplier. And D is the diameter of the backfill column in feet. Again, a number that you get from the supplier. Um, you calculate the number of anodes for the system's life expectancy. Um, each cathode uh, system will be designed to protect the structure for a given number of years. This is just an assumption you make I'm going to design for 10 years, 15 years, whatever. Then the assumption is we're going to have to go out there and replace those anodes because they will have corroded away. The uh, calculating these, uh, the number of anodes uh, based upon the system's life expectancy, uh, equation 27 is used. N is the number of anodes. Uh, L is the expected life 
expectancy, which is a number that you assume, U is the weight in pounds of one anode, and I is the current density required to protect the structure in milliamperes um, per square foot. Select the number of anodes to be used. You have calculated the number of anodes two different ways using equations 2, 6, and 2, 7. And you select the larger of those two numbers because both of those uh, criteria need to be satisfied. Uh, the next step, select the ground bed layout. In other words, where do you put these uh, anodes? And generally speaking, with a galvanic or sacrificial anode system, you place them uh, uniformly around the protected structure uh, based on the surface area of the protected structure. So as an example, uh, if you have a 12 inch diameter pipeline and it uh, necks down to a six inch diameter pipeline, the uh, anodes would be closer together uh, along the 12 inch reach of the pipe uh, than along the six inch reach of the pipe. So the, uh, uh, the area to be protected by one anode is the total surface area to be protected. Again, this is going to be, you know, 5% of the total area or something like that. Uh, and N is the total number of electrodes to be used, which you calculated uh, uh, using equations 2.6 and 2.7, and you took the larger of the two numbers. Um, and uh, that is the ground bed layout. So you've now got a one system, a specific anode, uh, a specific number of anodes, where they are going to be located. That's your design. Uh, <clears throat> you can then, using a uh, methodology uh, identified as NACE standard RPO2, to calculate the life cycle cost for a proposed design. So you've got one design. You use NACE standard RPO2 to calculate late the life cycle cost of that alternative. And now uh, that is your design. Uh, and then what you do is go back and do it all over again, uh, selecting a different anode, uh, calculating the number of those anodes required, the two different ways we looked at. And um, that then you take the larger of those two numbers of anodes and uh, uh, distribute them uh, in accordance with uh, the methodology for determining the location of generally speaking, uniformly distributed around the protected structure. And then you go back and you, and so you've now got a, uh, and then you calculate the life cycle cost for that design. So you now have two designs with two different life cycle costs. Go back and do it all, all over again another two or three times. And you end up with four or five uh, designs with uh, each with its individual life cycle cost and you select the design uh, with the uh, most favorable life cycle cost. So that's walking through the steps uh, to design a uh, sacrificial anode system. Now for the uh, impressed current system, the more corrosive soil environments, uh, uh, compared to the nine steps in the uh, sacrificial anode design process, there are 13 steps 
in the impressed current uh, design process. Uh, so you review the soil resistivity data, uh, review the current requirement test if uh, you were able to conduct a current requirement test uh, in the field. And uh, uh, select an anode. Uh, in the case of the uh, 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 impressed current systems for basically the reason that uh, uh, consumption of the anodes is less. The, the uh, impressed current systems use uh, an iron alloy um, anode typically, high silicon chromium bearing cast iron. So not, it doesn't have to be zinc or magnesium or anything like that. So the, uh, uh, you just, uh, again, arbitrarily select the uh, uh, anode uh, ion, uh, uh, that you, metal that, that you want. And uh, again, these uh, anodes come in a uh, burlap sack, if you will, and backfilled with carbonation backfill material. And here is a quick picture of uh, some of these commercially uh, available products, weight, dimensions, package size, et cetera. Uh, now, with the uh, impressed current system, you're going to calculate the number of anodes uh, three different ways compared to the two different ways. and. Uh, uh, one is to satisfy the manufacturer's current density limitations using equation 2.9. The manufacturers of these anodes, because they want them to have a reasonable service life, they uh, specify that the current density <laughs> needs to be limited. And so calculating the number of anodes required to satisfy the manufacturer's current density limitation, she would use equation 2.9, where the number of anodes required is the total protection current uh, in milliampers. A sub one is the anode surface area and I sub one is the recommended maximum current density output in milliampers. Um, you then calculate the number of anodes required a second way using equation 210. Uh, this is to satisfy the design life requirement, which is an assumption that you make uh, 10 years, 15 years. And you calculate the number of anodes a third way to meet the maximum anode to ground bed resistance requirement using equation 211. Uh, R sub A is the anode's res resistance. And the other factors are what you see there. I'm having to kind of speed things up here because we're getting close to the end of our time. You select the number of anodes to be used using the highest number calculated <clears throat> by equation 29, 210, 211. Uh, select an area for placement of the anode bed, unlike with the uh, sacrificial anode system with an impressed current system. Typically, you locate all of the anodes in a rather compact uh, anode bed at that location on your project site where the soil resistivity is uh, uh, lowest. And this is because you want the, uh, um, hang on just a second. Um, the, um, you want the, uh, uh, the the resistance that the negatively charged oxygen ions experience to be minimal. 
calculate the total resistance and calculate the uh, anode dead resistance, uh, you're going to need to uh, go through these calculations here uh, independently. But you uh, calculate the uh, uh, <clears throat> structure to electrolyte resistance, and you uh, calculate the total circuit resistance. Uh, an additional calculation you need to make is the rectifier voltage, because you have a rectifier. And the equation 16 is used to determine the voltage required at voltage output from the rectifier, where I is the total protection current in amperes, R sub T, total circuit resistance, and with a 150% uh, uh, safety factor. Uh, select a rectifier. You now have a system consisting of uh, a specific uh, uh, anode, a location for an anode bed. You have a location where you can get electric uh, AC utility power for the rectifier. And this may be in a remote location. So you can have some significant cabling costs uh, with an impressed current system. And um, the um, now chapter three here, I wanted to get to it expeditiously because this is the current requirement test that you may conduct in the field to uh, determine the current required uh, uh, in the circuit for adequate uh, corrosion protection, cathodic protection. And the test setup, again, which you can only <clears throat> uh, undertake if the uh, structure to be protected exists out there in the ground. Uh, the current requirement test is illustrated by this figure 3.1. Now, uh, in this figure, there are three voltmeters that are shown. Uh, the one on the left and the one on the right, you, you can ignore. The only one you're concerned with is uh, voltmeter A, which is measuring the voltage uh, between the electrolyte and the protected structure. And so your, your test setup. You connect the wire to the protected structure. Uh, you insert in it uh, what is called here a current interrupter switch. This is, is a, a rheostat. It's an adjustable resistor. And you put an ammeter in the circuit. You put a source of current, a battery, uh, in the circuit and connect the uh, other pole of the battery to electrodes that you stick in the ground in the uh, electrolyte. And so uh, you know the voltage in the circuit, <clears throat> um, and you uh, 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 you you then uh, take uh, twist the knob on the rheostat to vary the resistance in the circuit, and you uh, <clears throat> watch the voltmeter. A. And when it reads minus 0.85 volts, that's your rule of thumb, uh, then you have uh, arrived at the uh, condition of current flow that you need to have to protect the structure. So you then, uh, you've, you've turned the knob on the rheostat and uh, watch the voltmeter and it now reads 0.85 volts and you look at the ammeter and that tells you the current that you need in the circuit. So that is gives you the current required <laughs> when you can, uh, uh, when your structure exists in the ground. Okay, um, that brings us to the end of our allotted time. And now the next chapter here is a bunch of 
uh, examples of galvanic or sacrificial anode cathodic protection. And then following is chapter five, which is uh, examples of uh, impressed current systems. Um, but uh, we don't have time to go through all of these. So I would encourage you to uh, uh, get a copy of these PowerPoints and uh, uh, go through this remaining material uh, at your leisure. And that uh, uh, gets us to the end of our uh, uh, time that we've got here. So uh, I'm just going to bring things to a conclusion here. Uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to chat with you. I hope this was about uh, what you were looking for when you signed up uh, for this webinar. And uh, now I'm just going to bring things to a conclusion here. Uh, and thank you very much for uh, letting me chat with you and wish you all to have a nice rest of the day. So thanks a lot. Bye.